Welcome to the Standard of Truth podcast, hosted by historian Dr. Garrett Dirkmott, where we explore the early days of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and gain rare historical insights into how a young farm boy was able to establish a new church and grow it by way of visions, manifestations, and miracles. Hello, welcome to another edition of the Standard of Truth podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Dirkmont, and I'm joined by my friend, Richard LaDuke. Hello. Last podcast, we talked about kind of the evolution of the criticisms of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith early on in the church. We ended with talking about Solomon Spaulding's manuscript. So when they found the manuscript, Garrett, my guess is that the argument went away and that it no longer exists anymore. Uh no. Well, that would be so that would be what we would call a logical guess, uh, as if, you know, A plus B equals C. But when it comes to anti Mormonism, A plus B equals I bet there's a whole bunch more A's. Um and 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 so it it really does I mean it takes the it, for for seventy years roughly, it was the the argument against the the origins of the Book of Mormon. Now, of course, when Eber Howe first presented it in his book he didn't claim that it was, you know, the word for word thing taken from. In fact, he even said in that gigantic title we read last time that was just like, oh yeah, da, 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 you know, um, even he said that the historical parts of it were taken from that book. But that wasn't the argument that most other people started making with it. That, oh yeah, that's just where the Book of Mormon comes from. And, and you can see uh, all originates back to the point of how in the world there's there's two problems with the book well there's lots of problems with the book of mormon as far as they're concerned but there's two main problems when you're trying to dismiss the book of mormon the first is that it exists where does it come from how 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 did you know farm boy joseph who according to jonathan hadley is very illiterate produce this 600 page book right so how how did that happen so the actual production of the book itself is in and of itself a problem. But the second major problem is how is it people think it's from God? That's the second problem. So there's two, two problems. One, that the book exists. Okay. It seems to be entirely outside of Joseph's possibility. But second major problem is that seemingly intelligent people, seemingly yeah, I, I know if you're an antagonist listening to this podcast, you're, you're not one of those intelligent. Fine, fine. I don't have to be one of those. But there are people far more intelligent than me who believe that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. The reality is there are people that are illiterate who hear the stories of the Book of Mormon who believe the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. There are people with multiple PhDs and they believe the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. So... How is it possible that it's convincing people? So there's actually two aspects to this. Now, Eber Howe really focused mainly on, on that first. You know, where does the idea come from? Well, the historical part was taken from Solomon Spaulding. The argument then developed that probably there were, you know, again, as people were desperately with their Unisom anti-Mormonism trying to find something that would help them sleep at night, they, they, that there were actually probably two Solomon Spaulding manuscripts. And even though James Fairchild, the non Latter day Saint, if you haven't, if you haven't listened to part one and two of this, you, you probably should, uh, just because that uh, all these people we've already talked about, but, um, that when James Fairchild saying that there needs to be another explanation for the origin of the Book of Mormon, the argument then developed, well, maybe what actually happened is that Solomon Spaulding revised his book. And the way he revised it was to being the Book of Mormon. And that it's that second manuscript that's lost that is now also out there. And if we were to find that, then that would actually be the origin of the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is the equivalent of the Millerites um, in 1844 having the great disappointment where they thought Jesus was coming. And spoiler alert to everyone listening, Jesus didn't come. And these people had sold their... They'd sold their farms. They had quit their jobs. They'd gathered together. They were certain that Miller had co had, had com calculated the end of the world exactly right. The problem with trying to calculate the end of the world is it's 
it really is a pushing your chips to the center of the table uh, thing, right? I mean, it's not like a, well, maybe God answered our prayers in a different way. Like we prayed for money, but maybe God gave us experience, you know, instead. God's still answering our prayers. He's answering in a different way. No, if you say Jesus is coming on this day and he doesn't come, it's pretty hard to cover for that. But what did they do? They simply, they said, well, actually we miscalculated. It's really next year. Again, spoiler alert, it, it didn't happen the next year. Now, this is what it feels like in the sense of these uh, these antagonists who want to hold the Solomon Spalding. And you, you can see why they want to hold the Solomon Spalding theory. It was so powerful. It was so powerful that it was what every intellectual used to dismiss Mormonism every time it ever came up. So for them... Losing this very ready explanation for the origins of the book seemed to be a, a gigantic uh, catastrophe. Um, uh, this doesn't carry a whole lot of weight, as you might imagine. Now, again, it it carries a whole lot of weight with your you know your excommunicated cousin's boyfriend, who you know is pretty certain he knows where the Book of Mormon came from. But it doesn't carry any weight with scholars. They don't say things like, obviously, there was a second hidden Solomon Spalding manuscript that actually was just like the Book of Mormon, even though the one we found that was from him was nothing like the Book of Mormon. So um, it, it, in the absence of that, there were other arguments that eventually came to the fore. Um, one of the more prevalent arguments today is one that started to get a little bit of traction surrounding the turn of the 20th century, and, and I think is used much more so now today. And that is that, well, Joseph Smith took the ideas from other existing books. Okay, with the Solomon Spaulding manuscript, the idea here is that he essentially stole and appropriated other people's work, right? Um, but with um, these other arguments, it's not so much the argument that Joseph plagiarized the whole thing, but that Joseph Smith plagiarized the idea uh, that they got the concepts from it. And probably uh, the first and, and, you know, really better of those arguments. And again, if you're listening to this and this is all you do is early antagonistic arguments against the Book of Mormon, you're going to be saying, well, what about X and what about Y and what about Z? Um, Yes, there are obviously lots of other arguments. This is just a brief overview. I am not a linguistic specialist. Frankly, I'm not even a specialist in speaking, So, uh, which is already readily apparent. So there are more things than what I'm covering here. I'm just going over some of them. But um, that, that first argument is about a book that was published in 1823 um, by a man by the name of Ethan Smith. Ethan Smith... Uh, his book is called View of the Hebrews. The argument of the book is that North America, especially, but, but generally all the Americas, were actually um, inhabited by members of the lost tribes of Israel. Now, you can see why very quickly, as a Latter-day Saint, your ears are pricking up, right? Wait, wait a minute here, right? And... Um, Smith is a, he's a congregationalist minister. I mean, he's, again, he's a, someone who knows the Bible really well. And so part of the argument that he's making is a biblical one. He, he is quoting from, you know, passages from Isaiah, you know, he's, he's quoting, he's quoting uh, prophecy about the lost tribes in his, you know, efforts to argue that, that the native Americans are actually descended from the lost tribes of Israel that they, they must have come over here, you know, as this broken off branch. And so you can see why that comes across as a very powerful argument that, well, maybe view of the Hebrews is a, it is the real origin of the book of Mormon. Now, um, the, you know, I guess it'd be a pretty rough podcast at this point. I'm like, and that's it. We'll see you later. I mean, uh, and you're like, Oh, now I know. But, Let's examine uh, that argument in light of, of, again, the two major problems of the Book of Mormon for someone who's an antagonist. That it exists, 
you know, in totality and that it exists in a way that convinces people that it would otherwise be intelligent. Um, so first, uh, the, the view of the Hebrews, um, is making arguments that certainly, like I said, would make a Latter-day Saint feel uncomfortable. And, and the reason why antagonists of the church really love this argument, the reason why it's so useful is it, many Americans are unaware of aspects of early history, let alone church history, but early American history. And so if you don't know that anyone ever wrote a book called view of the Hebrews that put forward the idea that is in the book of Mormon, that, that lost tribes of Israel came to America and you find out that that book was published by a minister and that book was in circulation in you know, New England and in New York. And it's possible, but again, this is a very important thing. There's actually no evidence that Joseph Smith owned it or, or read it beforehand, but it's, it's at least theoretically possible that he did now judging, you know, let me just, you know, be frank from his historically speaking, it doesn't seem like Joseph Smith's doing a whole lot of light reading in anything that's outside of the Bible. Uh, he's certainly not picking up light writing from those things if he's doing it. You know, the more you read, you'd think the better capable you'd be as, as a writer. And that certainly doesn't seem to be the case when it comes to his own writing. But And, and so to us, it's a shocking thing that anyone else is making the same argument. And so you can see the antagonistic argument. This, it, it sounds like it's, it's the easy math. What's our A? There was a book written by a minister that quoted all kinds of things from the Bible to say that the Indians were actually descended from the tribes of Israel. B, Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon that quotes all kinds of scriptures in the Bible that say that the Indians are from the tribes of Israel. So therefore, Joseph Smith stole that from view of the Hebrews. When you are confronted with that argument and You've never heard it before. Like we talked about in our early podcast about sources, it can be a powerful argument, not because the argument itself is very powerful, but because you haven't heard it before. It sounds more powerful and it sounds historical. It's new and, and it can be unsettling, but it actually wouldn't cover either of the two main problems that we'd be talking about. Let's say that Joseph Smith did. Now, I don't believe this. This is the caveat, just so everyone knows, and then someone can cut this out later, but no, he said this. Let's say, for argument's sake, that that is where Joseph Smith got the idea. Well, again, I don't believe this. I can't, I can't even go through this theoretically. You've now said this three times. Yeah. I don't believe I, it. I, I just the, the rest of the podcast is going to be me saying, Joseph Smith's a prophet, Joseph Smith's a prophet, <laughs> Joseph Smith's a prophet. <laughs> Theoretically, <laughs> if I was going to make the argument that Joseph took the idea from view of the Hebrews and even some of the, the biblical passages that point to it, right, that actually wouldn't help me explain the origin of the Book of Mormon. Why? Well, because the Book of Mormon isn't a theory. It isn't just, you know, a working paper, uh, a working, a working hypothesis about Joseph Smith and mushrooms. Like we talked about earlier, uh, it's an actual book with a narrative with dozens of different narratives and different voices and viewpoints that's cohesively written in this, you know, in its early edition, 600 pages long, right? Just having the idea that Hebrews came to America um, and that's where that's where the Indians came from wouldn't actually create that book. The fact that even if you were to say, well, there are some passages in the Book of Mormon that are quoting parts of Isaiah and those same passages in Isaiah is what is what Ethan you know, uh, Smith has in his book. Again, that sounds like it's amazing evidence. If the entire book was quotes of Bible passages from the Bible, but it's not. I, look, I let me sympathize with everyone listening. I understand it 
feels like when you're reading second Nephi, that the entirety of the book of Mormon is a quote from Isaiah. It feels like that because you're slugging through it. You're desperately trying to, I can't wait. When do we get their eyes? Can we, when are we going to do those wars in Alma? At least that's fun. Um, you, I understand that it can feel like there's a whole bunch in there, but the reality is there's actually not very much right compared to what the book is as a whole. There's not very much. That's a direct quotation from the old Testament, you know? So even if I granted you, which I don't again, that Joseph Smith simply took those passages from Ethan Smith's book from view of the Hebrews and then placed them in the book of Mormon, that would solve, a, you know, a very small portion of the first question. Where does the book of Mormon come from? Well, he just copied those passages. Okay. And now where does the other 85% of the book come from? Well, see, and that's the problem. The problem is, is not that there might be crossover from view of the Hebrews and the book of Mormon. The problem is there's not enough crossover. There's not enough crossover to create the book that exists. Again, if the Book of Mormon was simply a theory, if it was a sermon that Joseph Smith gave one day saying, you know what I just thought of, what, what God just gave me? Maybe, maybe the Native Americans are actually descended from the Lost Tribes of Israel. If that's what we were talking about, then that might be an okay argument. But the Book of Mormon actually exists. Um, and that's nothing to talk about. The second level of argument, and that is it's persuasive to people. Uh, the very fact that you might not have heard of view of the Hebrews until just now uh, suggests that it's not exactly the, the, the greatest, you know, the, the most well-known bestseller of all time. You know, it's not bumping Jane Austen off of, uh, off of the top 10, you know, the New York times top 10 list, uh, bestseller list. So that that's the argument that's made now. Now, a further examination of this, um, as I said, part of the reason why this argument is so powerful is that I don't know what's going on in American history. In fact, I can say pretty authoritatively, even though I'm not a historian who studies this, that the idea that the Americas were populated by parts of remnants of members of the Lost Tribes of Israel that idea is actually the oldest published idea in North and South America. Now, when I say oldest published, I'm clearly not making any reference to, you know, the Mayans and the Aztecs and their, and their writings from a European. It's the earliest idea that exists. Only if I think that Ethan Smith invented the idea that Native Americans were descended from the House of Israel, would that be a, a very powerful argument? And even then, like we said, it wouldn't write the Book of Mormon. But the reality is the earliest book published in North or South America it's, it, it is a book by someone who is both heralded and hated in the world of history. His name is Friar Diego Landa. Landa was the spiritual uh, person over the conversion of many of the Mayan Indians in the 1550s after their conquest by the Spanish. Um, you know, to put that in perspective, uh, Landa is writing 220 years before the Declaration of Independence. It, to kind of put it in perspective, America has existed as a country essentially as long as the time between when Diego Landa was writing and the establishment of America. This is a long period of time, right? Why did I say he's both, he's both infamous and heralded? Well, Landa in his effort to convert the Mayans, um, takes some really heavy handed tactics that includes destroying many of their religious artifacts and most painful to historians. I'm sure there's a Mayan historian listening right now who's shedding a tear probably. Landa decides that the codices that the Mayan have created, they have, they, they have these books they've written, these codexes. He decides that they're heretical and so he orders them all burned. So we, we would have had this massive written history of the Mayan civilization from, from the Mayans. It would have given us so much better 
insight into their civilization. And Prior Diego Landa decided that they were heretical and he burned them. So that's why he's infamous to historians because he destroyed so much of the written history of early Mesoamerica. At the same time, and this doesn't make up for what he did, but at the same time, what he did do is he wrote a book called uh, uh, The Yucatan Before and After the Conquest. It's the first book written in North, in North America, well, North or South America. It's the first book. And in that book, Diego Landa, which you can get, you can get an English translation of it. You can go, uh, you can go on uh, Amazon and find it somewhere. Um, and in that book, Landa makes this assertion about the Native Americans. In fact, he, he talks about how some of the old men of the Yucatan say, I'm not quoting this exactly. I don't have it in front of me, although I should. Um, but he says, some of the old men of the Yucatan say that, that, uh, that their ancestors told them of a lost white race that used to inhabit this continent. And he says, if this is true, then all the inhabitants, uh, all the inhabitants of the Americas must be descended from the lost tribes of the house of Israel. So that's a conclusion. Now that's a pretty natural conclusion actually for a, for a religionist in the 1500s, because you believe that God is working his will everywhere. And so coming to the conclusion that if there are people in North and South America that you didn't expect to find there, that God must have in some way moved and placed them there is actually, a, it's a pretty natural conclusion if you are subscribing to, you know, the, the, the understanding that God is the one who does everything, right? So how did God do this is the question. It is a different way of looking at the world than many, you know, secularist, you know, Americans today look at it. You know, how do I scientifically explain this? Landa is not asking, how do I scientifically explain this at all? Landa is saying, how do, how does God, how did God do this? Which is a very, it's a very different question. You're, you're not even claiming that science is a part of it. It's how, how is it that people are here? How did God get people here? Well, if God is going to get people somewhere then it's only natural to assume if God's going to be doing something that's that active, he'll be doing it with the people that God's made a covenant with, right? That, that, that that's that natural progression of, of idea. Now, for any of my, uh, you know, uh, native American, uh, listeners, uh, obviously, Landa is utterly dismissing every aspect of Native American. That, that's that's the main point. Okay, so I'm I'm not advocating that Land is right. What I'm saying is this is what this is what he's doing. He is from a very Eurocentric, very very Catholic centric viewpoint, trying to find a way to explain how God did what God obviously did because he sees people where they shouldn't be, at least according to what they previously thought. Landa, um, and this idea that God must have brought people to North and South America. And if God's going to bring anybody anywhere, well, it makes sense if it's God's people. And who are the part of God's people that are missing? Oh, wait, the 10 tribes. It, it, it's almost this natural idea. And, and so, again, that might make a Latter-day Saint feel uncomfortable. Because if the reason why you really love the Book of Mormon is it tells an explanation of where uh, Native Americans came from, or at least uh, where some of them come from, then then it might make you feel uncomfortable that there are other people giving that giving that theory beforehand. But my point in bringing this up is that. The idea that because Ethan Smith published his book that said that, that that is the reason why that idea would be in circulation among Americans. And therefore, Joseph Smith took that idea, having read that book. And that's where the Book of Mormon comes from, is actually a reflection of a lack of understanding of how prevalent the idea actually was among uh, people and had been for 300 years that in fact, that God must have somehow populated uh, North and South America. And if God did that, then he must have done it with the lost tribes of the house of Israel, which of course, isn't exactly what the book of Mormon says, right? The book of Mormon 
is is not using the lost 10 tribes who are off in Assyria and then they migrate north and then they find their way across. I mean, that's, that's actually not the Book of Mormon story. The Book of Mormon story is even though Lehi uh, and his family are are from the tribe of Joseph, you know, which is, is, you know, Manasseh and Ephraim are those, some of those lost tribes. They are residents of Judah. Uh, they, they are living in Judah decades and decades and decades after the Assyrians have already driven off the, uh, 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 well, carried off the, the Northern tribes. And those Northern tribes are what we often call the lost tribes. Technically speaking, I mean, I guess depend, depending on how you wanted to technically look at it, um, you could call Lehi and his family parts of, you know, the lost 10 tribes because they are from, you know, Ephraim and Manasseh, which are some of those lost tribes, but they aren't lost with those lost tribes. They aren't taken to Assyria with all the other lost tribes. They are already living in Judah and Assyria has already destroyed uh, Israel. It's 120 years later that Babylon is going to destroy Jerusalem. So Lehi and, and Nephi, they're, they're residents of Judah. They're part of the Southern kingdom. They're part of the only kingdom that's left, by the way, the, the, the Northern kingdom has gone. And so in, in one very important way, the argument's not actually the same. The argument that, oh, it's it's the lost tribes of Israel that, you know, they obviously eventually ended up here in America actually isn't the argument that the Book of Mormon is making. It's making the argument that essentially refugees from the Babylonian destruction of Judah are, are part of what comes to America. But of course, you know, someone who's just looking for an easy explanation of, of the Book of Mormon's origins, they might throw that up there either way. The point being, there isn't any actual evidence of this, right? So we don't have, oh yes, Joseph Smith is using the book. Joseph Smith is quoting from the passages in the Book of Mormon. There isn't evidence of it. It's just one of those things that like, well, here's something you don't know about. And, you know, uh, one of the proponents of this theory was Fawn Brody. And, you know, she said something to the effect of it's really hard to believe that Joseph could have the same idea uh, that the the uh, the of the Book of Mormon springing from the lost tribes and Ethan Smith book, which just so happens to be published in in America, you know, a decade earlier, says the same thing. Well, uh, I, when when someone says something like it just stands to reason, what it means is. They don't have evidence. That's what it means. Because if they had evidence, they wouldn't say it stands to reason. They would say, here's the evidence. Here's the proof. Instead of, well, I find it pretty hard to believe that that's, that's not evidence, right? Um, you know, that's very helpful for you if you're ever, you know, uh, you know, if your parents are ever asking you where you were one night, you know, it's good to know the difference between it stands to reason and what actual evidence is because the the reality is that there isn't any beyond well how convenient right well history is filled with convenient occurrences simply because uh the the idea which is a very natural idea that if there are people in north and south america that god must have made it that way that that's the most natural christian belief that exists the fact that the Book of Mormon explains how that way is, 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 is not, you know, a demonstration that Joseph Smith copied the whole, the, which he clearly didn't, which you can already tell just by reading View of the Hebrews. You can read it. And what's it's, interesting is Mormons actually see it the opposite way. It, so in Joseph Smith's day, as they're trying to prove to people that the Book of Mormon really is true, they will quote from view of the Hebrews to say, see, look, there's other people who think that this is the way it is, which is also a really weird thing to do. If you, if you plagiarize from that book, right. But you so, bring it back around. Like, let me, let me quote from the book. I plagiarized, but it seems like this has, this runs into the same problem that the Solomon Spalding manuscript does, right? Like even coming up with the idea here, yeah. we still have, here, we still have 
a bunch more that's not there. There's a bunch more that's not there and not just a bunch more thrown at a page. A bunch more thrown at a page that causes people to believe that it is another testament of Jesus Christ. If the point of the Book of Mormon was to convince people that Native Americans were descended from the lost tribes of Israel, then maybe there would be some kind of an argument. But that's not, it's not even a major point of the Book of Mormon. I mean, you have to sort through various places in the Book of Mormon to even figure out what tribe Lehi's from. It's not up in front and center. It is, you know, tangential and tertiary. It is not in any way a major argument. Certainly it does that. Certainly it does, it, you know, it provide the, the history of, 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 of Lehi and his family and, and their descendants. But it is, not, it, is, it is not the point of the book, right? Religion, Jesus is the point of the book. And when people are converted, what they're converted by isn't, oh yeah, I read that actually Lehi's from Manasseh. That's not converting anyone. They're being converted by the fact that they can feel the Holy Spirit tell them that these really are the words of prophets, that this really is Jesus speaking to the people, that it really is another testament of Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, I, I think the theory is, is, is thrown up there, um, but it doesn't actually fully answer our first problem. Remember, our first problem is that the Book of Mormon exists. It would only actually give us an answer to some of the ideas very tangential ideas, by the way, that exist. It wouldn't create Alma chapter five. It wouldn't suddenly make Helaman chapters 13 and 14. Go read those and then go read Ethan Smith's book. And you tell me that they're the same author. They're not. Okay. So the bulk of the book, the, the most important part of the book is clearly coming from a different source. So even if I were to grant you that that the only reason Joseph had the idea that that the lost tribes uh, came to the Americas was because he read Ethan Smith's book, even though the Book of Mormon says something different, even though there's lots of other people already saying what Ethan Smith's saying, so it's not even a new thought. But even if I were to grant all that, the reality is, where does the rest of the book come from? And then further than that, since people are being converted by the Book of Mormon, not because it tells them where Indians come from, but because it has the words of Jesus Christ in it, how does that affect the second part? Even if Joseph stole the whole thing from, if, if the Book of Mormon was nothing but the view of the Hebrews writ large, that wouldn't explain the reason why people are being converted to Jesus by it, right? So they're actually two separate arguments. Now, look, I, I led with this one because this one's at least makes more sense, right? It's at least the argument that says, it's playing upon a lack of understanding of what Americans thought about Native Americans um, and uh, uh, in the 19th century. And so because we didn't know that, that, that makes it powerful. Like I had no idea other people were saying that, that that's where, and, and, you know, maybe that's a highlighted thing for us today. It's highlighted because Latter-day Saints are in the minority, the, the very, dis, very distinct minority of believing that at least some of the inhabitants of North and South America are in some way descended from, uh, from Lehi's family or the Mulekites or, um, the, 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 the way that the introduction of the book of Mormon reads today is that, is, is that they're at least among the ancestors that there, there's something to do with it. But that of course is, is not, you know, uh, the primary argument of, scholars who, who, who don't, you know, you know, surprisingly don't believe the book of Mormon is true. So, um, um, and so I think that's really highlighted to a Latter-day Saint today, because to us, we know that one of the biggest arguments of the book of Mormon that my friend who doesn't believe in Mormonism rejects is that Lehi and his family came from Jerusalem and they populated part of America. So that's a super highlighted aspect of the book's argument to us. It's a less highlighted aspect in a world where that's where many people already assume to be the case. The Book of Mormon is a problem, not because it's claiming that Native Americans were in any way descended from Hebrews. 
the Book of Mormon is a problem because it's not the Bible in 19th century America. That, that's why it's a problem, not, not because it's making a different claim about the origins of Native Americans. At any rate, let's move on to the, the other one. Um, this one's actually more frustrating for me. And I think it's more frustrating because it's less scholarly. And at least the way I've seen it used by people is far more deliberately, deliberately deceptive. And, you know, I try not to get too passionate on, on the podcast. Um, I, I, I don't, I probably fail a lot. I, there's a, well, there's a lot of things that I'm not very good at. And look, I don't have a script here. We don't, Richard and I are just sitting in, in, in a room, you know, all you know, we turn the air, we, we don't have a professional studio. So this is, you know, the air conditioning's off. So you can't hear it. Uh, we've got, you know, we're, we're, we're we're using technology, you know, uh, we're probably using Windows ME. I mean, the, 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 we are, we are, we're efforting here. So a lot of this is just stream of consciousness, which is the reason why you can fast forward it or listen to it on like eight times speed. Um, the, the, the reality is the other argument is more frustrating, I think, because at least the way it's being used is a much more deliberately, a much more deliberately obfuscating way. And that is that there's another book. So look, the view of the Hebrews, it proved to have some success in, and this again, this is a 20th century argument. This is not an argument being made in the 19th century, which is also something, uh, by the way, let's just take a minute on. If it's such a great argument as the origin of the Book of Mormon, why isn't it being made until the 20th century view of the Hebrews? What, why? Why did they have to go pretend there was a Solomon Spaulding manuscript if the proof that... The, they have the Ethan Smith manuscript in front of them. Yeah, they certainly knew about it. So why aren't any of them using that as the argument? Because it's not a very good argument. That's why. Well, let me give you a less good argument. If we're doing good, better, best, <laughs> this is worse, worser, and worser. Worser is just, just, just. I don't know how many ESTs you're going to put on the end of that. Um, and that is that there's another book. So let's, you know, let's move to another book that clearly is the origin of the Book of Mormon. Um. And that is a book called The Late War. Uh, and it, The Late War is written um, uh, in a way that also can be very, it can cause people to feel uncomfortable. The Late War is a book written by a guy by the name of Gilbert Hunt. Now, Gilbert Hunt, it, it, he is going to write a history of the War of 1812. And what he does is something that is, that, that people would occasionally do, and that is they try to write the book in imitation of King James English. They do that as a way of trying to provide some solemnity, and also, of course, it makes it very unique. Now, I'm going to just guess that there's somebody listening to this podcast who, when they were in the MTC, either themselves or somebody else that they were with in their little pod there, started trying to write either letters or in their journal with Book of Mormon jargon, right? They started like, you know, I, Garrett, having been born of goodly parents, and they, they kind of started trying to incorporate that because, you know, the Book of Mormon is your life when you're in the MTC, and, and it's kind of cool to you to use that language as a way of describing your experiences. Maybe I'm the only person who <laughs> multiple people in my, in my, my group did that. But, um, so th that's part of what, what, what Hunt is doing there. It's, it's a way, I mean, look, there's all kinds of histories of the war of 1812. So what's one way to make your history stand out? He's writing it in 1816. So he's writing it just a couple of years after it's over is by making it sound in this kind of scriptural sort of way, you know? Uh, so uh, for instance, it's going to, you know, use this biblical style. Here's, 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 you know, apart from it. Right. And it came to pass that on the morning of the 13th day of the 10th month, that Stephen, a chief captain of Columbia, surnamed Van Rensselaer essayed to cross the river, which is called Niagara with his whole army. Right. So you can see it's trying to use these biblical phrases. Uh, and it came to pass, which is all over the old Testament, right? Uh, the, the, the stating of the dates that way, talking about chief captains, well, some of that similar language is, of course, in, in the Book of Mormon. A question is asked all the time, why is the Book of Mormon written in King James English? 
sometimes we think, well, this is, it's written in, you know, this is 19th century English, but it's not 19th century English. And in fact, the proof that it's not 19th century English is that Joseph in the 1837 edition of the Book of Mormon is going to edit the Book of Mormon text to try to make it sound more readable. Something that was perfectly acceptable in King James English is to use uh, the term was talking about a plural instead of were, right? Which is 100% the, the case in the 19th century. Well, Joseph's going to go through and change all that. By the 19th century, uh, in King James English, you could use the term which to refer to a person. By the 19th century, much like today, if you're talking about a person, you have to say who or whom, right? You don't say, you know, you know, Richard, which came to the house later, right? You would say Richard, who or whom? I actually don't know. I'm not an English professor, so I don't know. Um, my mom, though, is an English teacher. And since I know she's listening right now, she's, she's yelling at her iPod if she figured out how to download this episode. Um, this, uh, uh, um, those edits that Joseph makes, he makes precisely to try to make the language a little more readable. So that, you know, that begs the question. Well, why is the Book of Mormon written in this kind of King James sort of English if it's being translated in the 19th century? I get asked that question all the time. The, the primary answer to that question, by the way, is I don't know because I'm not a prophet and I'm certainly not God. So I have no idea why God chose to render the Book of Mormon in the language that he did. I, I don't know this, but let me... After saying, I don't know, so that's the, the first part, the I don't know, let me throw up at least a speculation for you to chew on. The reality is, there's a kind of a no-win situation here in the production of new scripture, right? Because if, the, the, the way that 19th century Americans understood scripture is King James English. That's what scripture was to them. That's what scriptural language was to them, which is the whole point of Gilbert Hunt writing his book about the late war using this, this biblical style English. It was a solemn way of writing and speaking. And we've even picked it up in the way that we pray, right? How do you pray with some these and some vows? And we'll, we'll, because that is a more holy form of speech. So if the Book of Mormon had been rendered in regular everyday 19th century English, and then you tried to convince people that it was scripture, how hard would that be for people to accept? If it didn't say, you know, and it came to pass that my father Lehi said, I have dreamed a dream or I have seen a vision. And if it instead said, it instead said, Lehi, who was Nephi's father, had a dream about God. Well, that doesn't sound very scriptural, does it? The reality is we have become conditioned, or at least they had too, to see scriptural words in terms of the King James English. That, that it, it is, it, it's actually one of the reasons why I would guess, and this isn't the case for all Latter-day Saints, but I would guess for many Latter-day Saints, you feel very uncomfortable when either reading or hearing someone read from like, uh, you know, the, the, the new revised standard edition of the Bible that's placing things into more plain English, even though it is much easier to understand, you feel a little uncomfortable because, you know, when, um, when Jesus says to, uh, Pilate, thou sayest that that's scripture. But if Jesus says to Pilate, well, you said so, well, that, do, that doesn't sound very much like scripture, but it certainly is a lot more understandable, right? And so th th what I'm saying is to criticize the Book of Mormon for the fact that it's written in King James English is to essentially say that there is no way that God could have rendered it. Because if God rendered it, normal, everyday English, people would have dismissed it and said, well, that doesn't sound like scripture at all. That's not what scripture sounds like. How can you tell me this is like the Bible? If God rendered it to sound like the Bible, which in fact he did, then the response is, well, it's just like a copy of the Bible. It's like trying to imitate the Bible. So the reality is there actually isn't a way that God could have had those words produced without someone criticizing one way or the other. 
And as Brigham Young uh, said about Joseph translating the Bible, we, we've used this quote before, but um, he says this in a meeting with Joseph Smith, that that if Joseph were to translate the Bible 40,000 times, it would be different every single time he did it. Because when God speaks to his people, he speaks to them according to their current capacity, their, their light and knowledge that they have right now, right? So if if that's the reason why it was delivered that way so that more people could understand and accept it for the for the for the uh testament of Jesus that it is then i'm sure god knows you know the analytics on that a lot better than i do so one of the criticisms that uh is used with the late war is that there are these huge sections that are so similar to those in the book of mormon that they were copied and that they were they were pasted could you could you speak to that and kind of kind of explain what they're doing there? Right. So if I'm if I'm first encountering the book The Late War and someone's encountering it, uh, the the way they're encountering it to me is saying this. Well, have you? I mean, you know, here read this passage from The Late War. And first of all, again, I don't even know that anyone ever wrote books that sounded like the Bible in the 19th century. So that genre of book existing, I don't even know about. So when I'm confronted with it for the first time, and I'm confronted in a way that is a nefarious way, this kind of like, bet you didn't know, that is going to tend to highlight every apparent similarity. The reality is the people that push this theory actually must not think it's terribly similar. And the reason why I say that is if they thought it was as similar as it was, then they wouldn't use so many dot, 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 dots to try to make the passages sound the same. Let me give you an example of, uh, of this. Okay. Something that might be shocking and breathtaking as, as uh, uh, a Latter-day Saint to read. Okay. Um, quote from the late war. Again, sorry rendered quote from the late war this is how they're presenting it with many dot dot dots which i'll read just so you can understand how many there are two thousand hardy men who dot 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 fought freely for their country dot 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 now the men of war dot 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 were dot 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 wow. yeah were wow. dot were, were wow. dot 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 men of dauntless courage Let's read from the Book of Mormon. 2,000 of those young men, dot, 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 to defend their country, dot, dot, dot. They took their weapons of war, dot, 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 were all young men, and they were exceedingly valiant for courage. Well, now, what if well I, they, didn't, they didn't dot, 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 were there. Yeah, what if, what if I were to read that without the dot, dot, dot? How would it read if I'm not saying the word dot, dot, dot out loud? Book of Mormon, 2000 of those young men to defend their country. They took their weapons of war, were all young men, and they were exceedingly valiant for courage. Late war without the dot, dot, dots. 2000 hardy men who fought freely for their country. Now the men of war were the men of dauntless courage. <gasps> it sounds almost exactly the same. Obviously, this is where the text of the Book of Mormon comes from. Now. You, you can tell the difference between wow. saying yeah, the dot, that, dot, dots out loud. Stark. Now, do you want to hear what it would actually read if we were reading the actual book? That sounds like that'd be lots of fun, right? <laughs> um, here is the actual passage from uh, uh, the late war that they are dot, dot, dotting up to make it sound exactly like the Book of Mormon. Immediately, Jackson took 2,000 hardy men who were called volunteers because they had unsolicited offered their services to their country and led them against the savages. Now the men of war who followed after him were mostly from the state of Tennessee and were men of dauntless courage. Sounds like straight out of Alma. Yeah. Well, let's read straight out of Alma verse 18, 50, uh, Alma 53, 18. Now behold, there were 2,000 of those young men who entered into this covenant and took their weapons of war to defend their country. Now behold, as they had never hitherto been a disadvantage to the Nephites, they became now at this period of time also a great support. And they took their 
For they took their weapons of war, and they would that Helaman should be their leader. And they were all young men, and they were exceedingly valiant for courage, and also for strength and for activity. But behold, this was not all. For they were men who were true at all times, and whatsoever thing they were entrusted, yea, they were men who of truth and soberness, for they had been taught to keep the commandments of God and to walk uprightly before him. And now it came to pass that Helaman did march at the head of his two thousand stripling soldiers to the support of the people in the borders of the land of the south by the West Sea. Now those passages are not similar. They are similar in the sense that it's talking about people who fought and they're similar in the sense in saying that they're courageous again the big point that they think they're they're winning you on is and they said the word 2000 well, the book of mormon actually provides dozens and dozens of different combat grouping numbers hundred thousand ten thousand so does every history of the War of 1812. If you want to pull up a history of the War of 1812, you can find 400 people, 500 people, you can find 600 people, 700 people, 800 people. So essentially, the only real crossover is that you're saying soldiers defending their country were courageous. My goodness. That clearly has to be... No one has ever said the words... That soldiers are courageous. Ever. And you know what else? Sometimes soldiers are young. Unbelievable. In fact, the late war doesn't even say that the volunteers are young. Because most of the volunteers are actually fairly, you know, in their 30s. But anyway. Um, uh, that, that gives you an example. And the reason why I said it, it upsets me so much. Because when I just read the two passages side by side. The way they've arranged them. These, these critics of the Book of Mormon. They make it seem like. It's cut and pasted almost word for word. What do you find? That it's not just verses in between those words. It's sometimes pages in between those words. It's actually sometimes books in between those words. There's a reason why real historians who are not Mormons don't argue that the Book of Mormon came from the late war. So let, let me put this to you this way. Maybe you're someone who's, who's you're having trouble with your faith. Someone's presented this argument to you before, and it's really, it's really struck you. It's troubled you. You don't feel good about it. If the whole point is you want a scholarly examination of these things, if the problem is you feel like the church hasn't told you about all of these different arguments, which by the way, they don't have the time to tell you about every single stupid argument that is made about, uh, that's why you're listening to the podcast. It takes a stupid podcast <laughs> to hear a stupid uh, argument. But if that's how you're feeling, then this is the question you have to ask yourself. If the argument that the Book of Mormon was simply cut and pasted from the book, The Late War, was such a great argument why isn't it being made by people with PhDs who write about this period in 19th century history? Are, are they also Mormon sympathizers like me? Are they apologists for the religion that they don't believe in? Is that the reason why they're not doing it? Have they decided that it wouldn't be a big deal to make an argument about where the Book of Mormon comes from? Or maybe they're just, you know, far too honest and kind, like most academics, that they're unwilling to offend a religious sensibility of somebody. Obviously, the reason why people aren't making the argument is because it's a terrible argument. And the fact that it's a terrible argument means if I were to make it as a scholar, even if I wasn't a Mormon, means that people would think I'm a terrible scholar. Uh, let, let me give you another example of this. You got you to have more examples because this is, this is fun. Um, oh, great example from the argument of, of these authors. Um, that again, so I'm going to read this without the dot, dot, dots. And so it's, this is, this is how they present it. Look at these side by side. Now, there are lots of dots. On. I'm going to read it first without the dot, dot, dots. I know they're ellipses. I'm just saying dot, 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 because that's what they are, right? Dot, dot, dot. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> third Nephi chapter eight. So this is, this is one of their examples. Thunder did shake the whole earth 
Cities were sunk, and the face of the whole earth could feel the vapor of darkness, so that for the space of three days that there was no light seen, great destruction had come upon them. Comparison to the late war. From the late war, again, I'm not reading the dot, dot, dots. Thunders, as the mighty earthquake which overturneth cities, and the whole face of the earth overshadowed with black smoke, so that for a time one man saw not another. Sharp rocks had fallen upon them. It sounds exact. Even the late war even says for a time one man couldn't see another. I, I'll bet that's never been written in any other book ever at any point in the history of time. But even further, let's let's see what it says. Let me read it now with the dot dot dots before I expand it. The Book of Mormon. Thunder. Dot dot dot. Did shake the whole earth, dot, dot, dot. Cities were sunk and dot, dot, dot. The face of the whole earth, dot, dot, dot. Could feel the vapor of darkness, dot, dot, dot. So that, dot, dot, dot. For the space of three days, there was no light seen, dot, dot, dot. Great destruction had come upon them. The late war. Dot, dot, dot. It starts, it, it start, <laughs> it starts with the dot, dot. I, I should say ellipses. I know I should. You're right now scream. My mom right now is like, Garrett, they are not dot, dot, dots. Mom, I need you to download the podcast for a sixth time and just, you know. Anyway, um, so late war. Dot, 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 thunders. Dot, 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 as they as the mighty earthquake, which, which overturned the cities. And the whole face of the earth, dot, 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 overshadowed with black smoke, so that for a time one man saw not another. Dot, 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 sharp rocks had fallen on them. Well, why don't we read the whole section to see? Now, this is going to be pretty lengthy. As you might imagine, with that many dot, dot, dots, you're having to pull a lot of things to try to make them sound similar. Here is the actual portion of the Book of Mormon. Like I said, this is going to take a while. I'm going to read this. This is a lot of verses, but this is the proof to you of the chicanery that's going on. And, and so, so as you as you prepare to read this, I, I I we've known each other for a long time. As as you talk about these kinds of things, I know that sometimes. Like with certain arguments, you can understand. Oh, I can understand how a person. This one specifically really seems to make you angry. <laughs> well, uh, yes, we'll cut. Because, because of the disingenuous we'll, nature. We'll of, cut this part out, and so you won't be able to hear this. But yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I think yeah, that's the thing. Especially because I, I fully understand that not everyone is going to believe uh, that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and I, I expect everyone to have their agency. And there are, there are, look. Most of the Christians out there in this world are amazing people. They love Jesus. They love God. They love other people. And they do things for other people. They're better Christians than I am. So I, I don't want to denigrate the fact that other people believe other things. That they Those beliefs empower them to help other people, which is what Jesus wants most from us anyway. But there is a very stark difference between someone who genuinely believes something different about Jesus and someone in a ham-fisted, non-academic, deliberate attempt to deceive cuts up a page the way that these, uh, are, uh, these uh, antagonists have deliberately to make them sound more similar so that they could convince someone who knows nothing about this book's existence that it's the real origin of the Book of Mormon. That is a deception. And the worst part about that deception, it is, oh, let me tell you the real truth. Let me tell you the real truth by making an argument that an academic wouldn't make? What in the heck are we talking about here? If you're going to talk about the real truth, fine. Let's talk about what scholars accept and what they don't accept. I'm under no illusions that most scholars accept that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. Of course they don't. But there is a very big difference between having a different belief and deliberately falsifying your data to try to convince someone of the opposite. And if it was such a good argument, you wouldn't be getting it from Jim on that web page. You wouldn't be getting it from Bill on his YouTube channel. You wouldn't be getting it from, you know, my Insta feed. If it was that good an argument, a scholar would be making it. And they're not. So why are people making it? So, but it's entirely possible that Jim and Bill, who have a particular blog, 
that are posting something like this that they don't even know these things necessarily. Or maybe, maybe. I mean, the, I mean, the the people who are making this argument specifically who pulled these things together. Oh, the person that yeah, pulled it yeah. together, absolutely. Yeah. But well, let me read what it actually. Like I said, this is going to be like Book of Mormon reading time, because for in order for me to put those two together, you know, the the, the two quotes which sound very similar to each other. Oh, thick blackness, right? In order for you to understand just how deceptive that editing is i have to read the entire passage that all those words came from so buckle up settle in this is your scripture reading for the day or it's not you gotta you know that's between you and god third nephi chapter eight and there was also a great uh, there was also a great and terrible tempest and there was also a terrible thunder remember remember thunder was mentioned Inasmuch that it did shake the whole earth as if it was about to divide asunder. And there were exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never been known in all the land. And the city of Zarahemla did take fire, and the city of Moroni did sink into the depths of the sea. And the inhabitants thereof were drowned. And the earth was carried up upon the city of Moronaha, and the place of the city where it became became a great mountain. And there was a great and terrible destruction in the land southward. But behold, there was a more great and terrible destruction in the land northward. For behold, the whole face of the land was changed because of the tempests and the whirlwinds and the thunderings and the lightnings and the exceedingly great waking of the whole earth and the highways were broken up and the level roads were spoiled and the many smooth places became rough and many great noble notable cities were sunk and many were burned and many were shaken till buildings thereof had fallen to the earth and the inhabitants thereof were slain and the places were left desolate and there were some cities which remained but the damage thereof was exceedingly great and there were many in them who were slain and there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind and whither they went, no man knoweth, save they know that they were carried away. And thus the face of the whole earth became deformed because of the tempest and the thundering and the lightnings and the quaking of the earth. And behold, the rocks that were rent in twain, they were broken up on the, upon the face of the earth in a, in so much that they were found in broken fragments and seams and cracks upon all the face of the land. And it came to pass that when the thunderings and lightnings and the storms and the tempests and the quakings of the earth did seethe, for behold, they did last for about the space of three hours. And it was said by some that the time was greater, never. Nevertheless, all these great and terrible things were done in the space uh, about uh, and done in about the space of three hours. And there beho- then behold, there was a darkness upon the face of the land. And it came to pass that there was a thick darkness upon all the face of the land, inasmuch that the inhabitants thereof who had not fallen could feel the vapor of darkness. And there could be no light because of the darkness, neither candles, neither torches, neither could there be kindled fire with their fine and exceedingly dry wood, so that there could not be any light at all. And there was not any light seen, neither fire, nor glimmer, neither the sun, nor the moon, nor the stars, for so great were the mists of darkness that which were upon the face of the land. And it came to pass that it last for the space of three days that there was no light seen, and there was a great mourning and howling and weeping among the people continually. Yea, great were the groanings of the people because of the darkness and the great destruction which had come upon them. Okay, so that's the entire passage that was rendered to about nine dot, dot, dots in six words, right? Um, Let's read the passage from the late war to show you how similar that is. But as the young men returned to where the army stayed, behold, the black dust in, in the hold caught fire, and it rent the air with the noise of a thousand thunders. And the whole army fell down on their faces, and the stones and the fragments of the rock were lifted high, and the falling thereof was terrible even unto death. Yea, it was dreadful as the mighty earthquake which could which overturned the cities, and the whole face of the earth round about, and the army of Zebulun were overshadowed by the black smoke, so that for a time no one man saw not another. But when the heavy clouds of smoke passed away towards the west, behold, the earth was covered with the killed and the wounded. Alas, the sight was shocking to behold, and the deed was ignoble. About two hundred men rose not. The stones had bruised them. The sharp rocks had fallen upon them. They were wedged into the earth. Their weapons of war were beat down to the ground with them. Their feet were turned towards heaven. Their limbs were lopped off. Um, this is clearly a description of the, you know, the black dust. This is a description of the, the magazine, the, 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 the uh, ammunition depot catching fire and exploding and, and killing you know, members of this, of this unit, you can see that while there might be a couple of words that are the same or similar, the argument that the entirety of that portion of the book of Mormon was taken from this 
is a really bad argument. And I could give you example after example after example. You could go through the whole book. So why is this being uh, ponied up as, uh, as proof of where the Book of Mormon came from? Because it tries to answer both questions, right? It's using biblical language. So that's the reason why it would convince people. And also it's that where the text itself comes from. So they think they found this argument that provides both things. But in fact, as you can see, it doesn't actually provide where nearly all of the text of the Book of Mormon comes from and is so different that it's not recognizable unless you deliberately cut up the text to try to piece words together. I can make Shakespeare right sound uh, like Jane Austen if I just cut up enough words and dot, dot, dot them to put them together. I mean, hey, they both talk about love. So therefore, Jane Austen sold everything from Shakespeare. Or humans talk about natural themes and all the things they write and talk about. Love and life and work and war. And so there, we only have so many words for dark, like one. So it, it, the reality is, if you're talking about something that's dark, you might use the word dark. If you're talking about, you know, a destruction, you might use the word destruction. I'm going to guess you could turn on the news right now and there's a chance you'll hear someone use the word destroy clearly because they're trying to write a new book of Mormon or because it's called the English language. Yeah, I think these this argument in particular is really frustrating to me because I've, I've seen people staggered by it. I've seen people have it presented to them as, look, it's word for word, the same thing. And it's not. Well, I, I remember one specific time uh, when the two of us went over to, uh, to a woman's house in our ward and um, her husband had been persuaded or had left the church and had been sending her lots of different things to try and take her away from the church. And this, this specifically was one of the things that she actually struggled with and he was really hitting hard. And I remember at, uh, it was one of those things and it, it, it's a common thing where I've had an opportunity to, to be with you on many of these times where, um, one of the people in the marriage, one of the spouses is, is really throwing it up on the, on the other spouse, all of these other things. And the spouse that might not know a lot about history of this or that or the other, they just have a testimony of the gospel and they know Joseph Smith's a prophet and that this is the true church. But I remember you essentially reading for her what you did here. And the relief that came over her face was, and then, and then immediately yeah, it was, the anger. It was amazing relief. And then instant anger. It was actually. because because it was the it was the deception part, and whether her husband knew about the deception or not, because it's possible that he, he also he saw, likely didn't. Yeah, that's what because I'm he was just reading what someone else told but, him to read. But the anger that she had to be like, this is the stupidest argument I have ever heard. Yeah, that was deliberately designed to try to deceive somebody, and I think that's the reason why. There are obviously many other arguments that people make about the origins of the Book of Mormon. And and look, I, obviously, hopefully you've listened to enough of these podcasts, or maybe this is the last one you'll ever <laughs> listen to, that you realize that I, I don't believe that you can reason your way to a testimony. Not fully. I think that understanding historical sources can help you contextualize questions that you have that can help you understand things better. But fundamentally, whether or not the Book of Mormon is true is not a provable or falsifiable argument or scientific, you know, uh, theorem. You can only know from God. You can only know by reading the Book of Mormon and praying and asking God if it comes from God. While I can help, you know, in a discussion about how bad some of these alternative arguments are, that doesn't prove that the book comes from God. There's only one way to prove that the book comes from God. And frankly, it's the same way that you prove that the Bible comes from God. The only way you can know that Jesus Christ is your savior and that he died for you, that he was resurrected and that because he was resurrected, you and every person that you love and have lost will be resurrected and you will see them again. It's not because of science. 
It's not because of logic. It's not because you can prove it. It's because it's true. And so I'm willing to, to walk down the road hand in hand with people discussing the logic of arguments that people make for or against the church. But all of us need to come to a realization that fundamentally, at some point, we will have to exercise faith. At some point, there will be questions that we can't prove. There will be answers that are not revealed. And at that point, it's only through the Holy Spirit can you know that these things are true. Don't allow these terrible arguments to derail your willingness to ask the question. Know that there's people who have looked at these things and know that they exist and are still certain that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. And it's not just me, and it's not just Richard, it's thousands of people who are well aware of these arguments and also certain that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. I think that coming to that certain understanding of where your faith lies, what you believe, matters far more. Because then when you're presented with these questions that you may not have an answer to right away, what you can know is there are other people who have examined these and they do have answers. There are answers that are out there. Whether someone uses a bunch of dot, dot, dots to try to prevent you from thinking there is an answer. There is. Fundamentally, though, the truth of God can only be known by the Holy Spirit of God. I hope that each of you can take that opportunity to pray again and ask God. And when you do, I hope that the Holy Spirit touches your heart and lets you know that this really is true. And even if, even if you don't decide that this is true, you at least trust that the Savior, Jesus Christ, is your Savior. That, that's what we all need to know. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Uh, hopefully you, you know, you, hopefully, you know, it's not just my mom next week, but uh, I really appreciate everyone's support and, and um, grateful for this chance we have to talk about these things. Thank you for listening to the Standard of Truth podcast, hosted by historian Dr. Garrett Dirkmott. If you know anybody that could benefit from the material in this episode, please share it with them. And for more resources, visit standardoftruth.com. Until next time.